Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the live Bald Ex... Well, in fact, the Bald Explorer Live is is how one should describe it. And uh, we're starting a new book today. I uh, was going to do a number of um, little readings and selections of things, but I've decided on, a, on a, an actual book to progress with. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is a book by J. J. R. Hartley. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, Julia's new book, by the way. No, uh, it is by LTC Rolt, and it's called Narrow Boat. Uh, I believe this is the copy that the lovely Linda Kane sent me. Um, there it is. I'm just uh, doing this because I want to get a sh screenshot for um, the thumbnail. Got one of those. Sorry. <laughs> Just doing a screenshot. There we go. Something like that might might suffice. Um, and then I can just say what chapter we're on on all of that. Hello to Michael Angel. St. George's Day. Uh, hello to you. St. George's Day. Fantastic. Uh, Audrey Forbes. Good morning to you. Rami Boo. Hello. Anne Osborne. Good morning, Anne. Hope you're well. Linda Kane. Morning, Richard. On a phone call. Get it on laptop for some reason. Oh, right. Fair dues. Happy St. George's Day. Um, I was looking then to, to, to uh, thinking about putting it on something as I read it. Um, <clears throat> why is this saying 728? Now, I, I've got that yesterday and a couple of days ago where it. I think my computer is telling me is is set up for a different time zone, although it's got the time zone here and I. When I set up the software, it says, when do you want the alert going out? And I put my time. But everybody then says, oh, it says seven hours ahead. Um, so I don't know why that's doing that. I, I have no idea. I'll have to look into it. I just keep forgetting at the end of each show. I, <laughs> I just think, thank goodness I got through it. Um, Fiona Hammond says, good morning. Uh, are we going to live? Oh, here we go. Same old thing. Um, at normal time or in seven hours like you ignore that just ignore that I haven't changed this ever and I don't know I keep t saying why I don't know and I'm beginning to feel like I've got to be like the government and keep saying stay indoors fight the NHS and just keep repeating and repeating and repeating the same message I don't know why I don't know why it does that please don't nag me about it Sarah, good morning. Um, well, that answers my question. Oh, thank goodness for that. Uh, Turbo Stream, good morning. Canal correspondent in the Midlands, where we're going to be reading about canals. Finally found you. Good morning, lovely Julia. Uh, pretty cover, says Linda. Yes, I think I'd, I think so. I'd forgotten. Yes, I think this is the version that you sent me. I do have another version. I found actually on my shelf because I did read. I have read it before. Linda, the times are str the times are strange, every time and the version. I know I don't understand. I'll I'll try and remember. I need to hang on. Let me write it down. If I don't write it down, at the end of the show, I will forget. That's a silly bit of paper. A, this is a bit of proper um, YouTube time error question mark. Yeah, oh, look, YouTube chime error. Scribbled it. OK. I need my uh, bag of flour. That's to, it's to rest the book on, of course. Uh, Steve G, good morning. Ed Loud, good morning. Mike Stevens, lots of people, good morning. Uh, Graham Roffey, good morning. We've definitely come out on the... On the um, Bald Explorer stream, and we? we haven't gone on the Vogue show stream. Liam, hello. Judith, hello. Uh, Turbo stream, I ignore the silly YouTube timestamp. Good. I'm very pleased because it was uh, it was somewhat driving me a bit bonkers. Um, in this book, I don't know whether you noticed, Linda. I'm sure. Some, what was fascinating is I've had a handwritten letter... From April the twenty first, nineteen thirty nine. I don't. I think this came out of another book actually, and I put it in this book because I was reading the other book. Hand scrawled letter. 
And this, I think, was in this book. This is a cutting from the Times from 1950, Tuesday, August the 15th, 1950. It's quite apropos of what we're going to do. Rally of Inland Waterways Craft. And uh, I don't know how much you can see of that. Let's just... Move all my, my, sorry, my gubbins. There we go. We can see a, a looks like a Telford designed um, building in the background there, and some working boats in the foreground. And and it, this is it sort of right at the beginning, as far as I know of the the you know saving the thing. It says here barges and other inland. Waterways craft have assembled at Market Harborough in Leicestershire for the first rally of its kind, which began yesterday. So it started on a Monday, on the 14th. Uh, the rally is organised by the Inland Waterways Association and is being held in conjunction with a town festival. Um, so so that, that must have been in this book, but I don't remember this being in the book. But anyway... That that doesn't say anything about the book, but uh, I need to keep those somewhere safe. How interesting! No, it wasn't. It, no, it wasn't. Oh, it, no, it was in the book. Oh, was it in the book? Well, it was nice that you sent it with the book. So there we go. Okay. I get myself into such confusion, don't I? I'd be rubbish on broadcast television because uh, now that bag of flour is in the way for the moment let's let's i need something else though there we go so here we go um narrow boat by ltc rolt part one chapter one introduction to the canals most people know no more of the can bear in mind this is written in 1944 most people know no more of the canals than they do of the old green roads which the pack horse trains once travelled. Of all the authors who have written of their journeyings about England, only Mr Temple Thurston chose to travel by water, and his delightful book, The Flower of Gloucester, published nearly thirty years ago, stands on one small shelf in my library which is sufficient to contain all that has been written about the canals. For they have lapsed into the, into the neglected obscurity which overtook the turnpikes when the railway deposed the stagecoach and ruined the great posting houses along Watling Street and the North Road. Now the motor car has brought the road into its own again, but the canals have withdrawn still farther into the shadows. Knowledge of them is confined to the narrow humpback bridges which trap the incautious motorist, or to an occasional glimpse from the train of a ribbon of still water running through the meadows to some unknown destination. I was equally ignorant myself until ten years ago. A relative of mine purchased Cressy, an old horse-drawn barge, installed an engine and converted her into a pleasure boat. I was fortunate enough to be a member of the crew on her maiden voyage and there and then acquired a passion for canal travel which has increased with the passing years. It seemed to me to fulfil in the fullest sense the meaning of travel as opposed to a mere blind hurrying from place to place and I felt certain that there could be no better way of approaching what is left to us of the old England of tradition that is fast disappearing. To step down from some busy thoroughfare onto the quiet towpath of a canal, even in the heart of a town, is to step backward a hundred years or more and see things in a different and perhaps more balanced perspective. The rush of traffic on the road above seems to become the purposeless scurrying of an overturned anthill beside the unruffled calm of the water, which even the slow passage of the boats do not disturb. Because they have been outpaced and forgotten in the, long, in the headlong flight of modern progress, 
Many old traditions and customs survive on the canals. Their people are still a highly individual community who have, so far, escaped the levelling influence of standardised urban thought and education. Interesting he says that because that's exactly the same, almost the same words as J.B. Priestley talks about, that standardised uh, urban thought and education. Fascinating. This is written almost a decade, well, just over a decade later. They rarely marry off the land. These are the uh, the old people on the, 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 the boaters. They rarely marry off the land, for they have a strong clannish pride, and the boatman roving and the boatman's roving life after sorry, the boatman's roving life allows him little time for courtship. Moreover, few girls not born in the boat cabin can stand the hard conditions of cramped quarters and exposure to all weathers. On still summer days, this peaceful gliding through the green heart of the country may seem idyllic, but it is a different tale to stand for hours at the tiller or work a boat through endless locks when cold winter rains come sheeting down, or when a bitter northeaster numbs the fingers, ruffles the water into little breaking waves, and makes lock sides treacherous with ice. Few boatmen can either read or write, and, like many country folk, they often appear surly and taciturn to, stain to strangers from the towns. But beneath this natural reserve, there shines a bright intelligence whose great charm lies in the fact that it has not been acquired from council schools and newspapers, but is in part traditional and in part evolved during many slow journeyings which only heron and with only heron and plover for company. What's a plover? Not heard of a plover before. Showing my ignorance there. P L O V E R. Plover. The inborn gypsy love of colour and polished metal finds expression in the gaily painted cabins of their boats and in the wealth of glittering brass ornaments which adorn them. These gay, vividly contrasting colours have become as natural a part of the canal scene as the bright plumage of a kingfisher because they are the product of an artistic instinct which is entirely self, entirely unselfconscious. The canals have their own inns and their own shops, and because they follow their own independent, torturous routes about England, often seem seem often seemingly often seeming purposely to avoid towns, the place names of those household words to the boatmen mean nothing to the landsman. And what attractive names they are Crow Roast last of 57 locks by the Grand Union Canal, which climbs out of London over the Chiltern Ridge. Stoke Bruin, a canal, a canal village by the southern portal of the Blissworth Tunnel in Northam Northampton, Northamptonshire. Great Haywood in Staffordshire, where the canal from the Severn meets the Grand Trunk Waterway from east to west. Crow Roast is only a cottage by a lock, and the other two are quiet villages, yet their names are as significant to the boatmen as those are of Crewe and Swindon to the railwaymen. As one would expect, such an exclusive community possesses a traditional language of its own. For instance, there is no port or starboard on the canal, the boat captain calling to, to the steerer, Hold in! i.e. towards the towing path, or hold out. The canal itself is invariably referred to as the cut, owing to its artificial character as distinct from the natural, natural channel of a river, while Cressy, the craft which gave me my first experience of canal travel, was not, in correct parlance, a barge at all, but a narrow boat built to pass the locks of narrow cuts. To become still more technical, she was a shroppy flyboat, which being interpreted means that she was built by the Shropshire Union Canal Company and worked for them fly. That is, she travelled night and day using relays of horses like the old flyers of the road. 
For this reason, she was slightly lighter and finer built than the slower craft, being intended for lighter and more perishable cargoes. When the Shropshire Union Canal ceased carrying, uh, when the Shropshire Union Canal ceased carrying with their boats. Sorry, I've got to get the sense of that sentence. When the Shropshire Union Company ceased carrying with their own boats, Cressy was sold to a miller at Maysbury on the Welsh Canal, for whom she carried coal until she changed hands once more and was converted. For ten years I kept track of her va vagrant wanderings about England, for I had made a resolve that one day I would acquire, if not Cressy herself, then a boat like her, and use her not merely as a holiday craft, but as a permanent home. I felt convinced that it would be possible to live both comfortably and economically in the space available. During this long period of waiting, I snatched a few all too brief trips aboard her, walked many miles along canal towing paths, and spent long we winters, evenings, planning the arrangements of a floating home right down to the smallest detail. A large-scale map of the canal system hung on the wall of my bedroom and I would lie abed planning imaginary journeys. I'd also acquired a second-hand copy of a book which is indispensable to any canal traveller, Bradshaw's Guide to the Canals and Navigable Rivers of England and Wales, by the late Mr Rudolf de Salis. This may sound dry reading, but I pored over it by the hour. Perhaps it was the names which appeared in the distant tables which fascinated me most and made the pages alive. Sheepwash sheep wash Staunch, Maid's Morton Mill and Wainload, Honey Street, Rushy Lock, Free Warrens and Stoke Bardolph, Fox Hangers, Sexton's Load, Afford D'Arcy and Withybed Green. These names for me had the power of poetry to conjure beauty in my imagination. Others stirred me no less by their oddity. Bumble Hole, sorry, Bumble Hole Bridge, Pope's Corner and Nip Square, Pluck's Gutter, Stupany Wharf and Blunder Lock, Old Man's Footbridge and Gunthram's Gout, Bates Bite Sluice, Dog in a Doublet, Twenty Pence Ferry, and Totter Down. What a wealth of history and legend spoke here and clamoured to be explored. Honey Sweet and Wainload had all the languorous acts, all the languorous scents and sounds of summer in them, while surely foxes barked in the dark coverts of fox hangers under the harvest moon. Did fishermen flock to Bates, Bates Bite Sluice? Who was Gunthram? And did they brew strong ale at Totterdown? I was resolved to find out. Meanwhile, each year brought tidings of declining canal traffic, of once thriving waterways becoming choked with weeds and mud, and worse still, of some closed for ever. Maysbury, Maysbury Mill closed down, and the little boatyard at Frankton on the Welsh marches, where Cressy was converted, soon followed. It was a significant comment on the times that the boat builder went to work as a carpenter at a nearby aerodrome on what, a year or two before, had been open fields. Next came the news of a burst. Part of the canal bank had blew open on the western section of the Welsh Canal, just below its junction with the arms that run north of Flangollen over Telford's great aqueducts at Chirk and Pont... At Chirk and Pont Casalti. It was not a serious matter, for any canal lengthman has told me since that it would have taken only a few days' work to restore the canal to navigable condition. But this was not to be. For the railway company, it was a welcome pretext to abandon, an to abandon a liability, and so 35 miles of the canal up to the lovely 
up to the lovely valley of the Severn between the Long Mind and the mountains of Montgomery, as far as Newtown, were left to fall to ruin. One horse boat trading to Welsh boat with coal was caught on the wrong side of the breach, and there, presumably, she will lie until her gay paintwork is weathered away and her timbers rot, for there is no way out. In a few years, the Welsh canal will doubtlessly become no more than a dry ditch, like the old Wilts and Burks canal, or the waterway connecting the Thames with the Severn, which looks as though it had lain idle for a century, although there are boatmen still alive who have worked over them. There is something indescribably forlorn about these abandoned waterways. Like old ruined houses or silent mills, they are haunted by the bygone life and toil which has left its deathless, eloquent mark upon them. Just as in old houses the worn steps are a memorable way of many vanished feet, so on the canals it is grooves worn by towing lines in the rotting wooden lock beams or the crumbling brickwork of bridges that bring the past to life. Most beautiful and most tragic of all is the old Thames and Severn Canal climbing up the golden valley between the great hills that wear their beechwoods like a mane. At the summit, at Sapperton, it pierces, it pierces the spine of the Cotswold Scarp by a, tunnel or two, by a tunnel two and a quarter miles in length, and thereafter winds across open wolds to join the young Thames at Inglesham above Lechlade. I think that's how you pronounce it, Lechlade. At Daneway, a tiny village clinging to the steep slope of the western portal of the tunnel, there is an old inn of Cotswold stone where they still remember the boats. The wide windows under their carved dripstones have seen them moored in what is now a grassy hollow, and they have watched the smoke of cabin fires soar, soar upward on still evenings against the dark background of the hanging beechwoods. The flower of Gloucester was one of the last boats to travel from the Severn to the Thames by this route, and I shall never cease to envy Mr Temple Thurston his good fortune. But perhaps it is because I have a particular regard for the Pottswold country that I regret the passing of this, the only Cotswold Canal. I regret most the passing of this, the, the only Cotswold Canal. These waterways are gone, but how many more would fall into ruin before I got my boat? I knew of two that were in great danger, the Kennet and Avon Canal from Reading, which crosses the Wiltshire Downs to Bath, and the Stratford-on-Avon Canal, which joins the Avon at Stratford by way of Lowson Ford and Preston Bagot in Arden. If I did not take to the water soon, these, and perhaps many more, might be lost to me. Then I was lucky enough to meet a companion who found the prospect of a roving life on a canal boat equally attractive. What were the alternatives? An unsettled existence in some urban flat or the uneasy isolation of a country cottage menaced by the ever-present threats of new aerodromes, bypass roads and desirable building sites. Those prospects didn't please us, and we resolved to find a suitable boat and get married the following year. I knew that Cressy had been laid up for some time past at a boatyard on the Oxford Canal at Banbury, so I went over and I saw her. Her cabin work stood in need of repair and she badly wanted repainting but her hull was still sound so I took the plunge and bought her. She had been fitted out as a holiday craft to accommodate a party of eight and my biggest job would be to convert her interior into comfortable permanent quarters for a crew of two. An engineer by profession I knew not the first thing about, as an engineer by profession, I knew not the first thing about carpentry, but I was determined to tackle the job myself, not only to ease the strain on my slender resources, but to obtain that added satisfaction which only one's own handiwork can give. Thus, 
it came about that ten years of waiting and planning came to an end one April day when I loaded my car, my old car, with luggage, blankets and provisions and headed for Banbury. At last, I was the captain of the Cressy and I could hardly believe my good fortune. That's chapter one. What did we think? Lots of lots of uh, lots of stuff there. That was I loved that. That was lovely, beautifully written. Hang on, let's go back and have a look at some of these comments. Uh, where's the mouse? There it is. Uh, right. We, I asked about a plover bird. A plover is a water bird. Aha. Uh -huh. um, it's pronounced. Oh gosh, plover, plover. Is that how it's pronounced? Pluver? Um, thank you, James Gilbert. Yes, hang on, I need to put a thing in there for a moment. We'll see if we do a bit more in a minute. Um, good morning. Uh, Pluvers are a widely distributed group of wading birds belonging to the subfamily oh, Charadrainae. I'm sure I've read that wrong. My eyes are still a bit blurry from looking close to now looking across the the room to the the the, the text there um, just looks like any other wading bird. Oh, okay. Morning, Philip. Is pluver? Have I got that right? Pluver. Because oh, sorry, the old eyeball there. The canals of England caught my eye for the first time. I was leaving Manchester Piccadilly Station, going north. Says Rita Joy, uh, Loy. They are. I mean, they're just fascinating. The canals. Um, Yes, plovers live on footpaths outside my home here, says the greater Billy. Um, oh, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Been in Townsville for eight years, says Sean. Have you? Where is where is Townsville? Mark Donnie McLeod says, uh, I know they moved out from Scotland in the 50s on the great migration on the old offer. They got a house there and others went further west to start a station. What's what's he talking about? Um, I think in Oregon we, we pronounce it plover. Uh, Bradford's Guide. Well, you could do with a Michael Portello of the Locks with that book. Yes, uh, you could do one, yes. Phil Hammond. Julia, have you got a way of contacting Robert Croser? Haven't heard from him for a while. Um, yes, I can, uh, I can contact him. Um, I've got him on my phone, actually. Uh, Sean, that's cool. Uh, Oregon, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sorry, just going, just going through, the, the, through the comments. Nigel Sadler says, Some of our families have to spend time with them of an evening, and even the Vobes can sometimes be more... The Vobes, the Vobes can be more fun. Obviously, I'm reading some of these out of context. Uh, that's great writing. He sounds more joy than misery, <laughs> misery Priestley. Yes, I think he's more optimistic. I mean, you have got to remember Priestley was writing and I think was quite shocked during the Great Depression. Um, and so they're climbing out of the Depression here. But these uh, the Great Depression must have been the point at which the canals were really in the 30s, were really just being abandoned and the motor car and the mechanics of new ways of doing things. Absolutely fantastic. Mike Stevens says, very just good description of writing, reading. Very good. I follow a few narrowboat tubers, so very interested. Uh, plover is pronounced as in glove. Oh. As in glove. P -p -p glove. Love. Plove. Plover. Plover. Is that what you're saying? It's like plover. The plover. Um, happy St. George Day. Yes. Well written. Very well read. Uh, in Aussie, we pronounce it as plov, plover. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. This is great because, uh, you know, um, my education wasn't brilliant when I went to school and English was a subject that wasn't taught very well at all. And that's why sometimes I struggle with um, unfamiliar words. Let's uh, let's have a do in a time. Let's do a bit more because this is a short, shortish chapter. Chapter 2, The Banbury Cross. It was a sunny, boisterous day, and my road 
lay over the northern Cotswolds. Most motorists choose the Tarmac Highway, which scorns the villages and cuts straight across the bare uplands through Stowe-on-the-Wold and Chipping Norton. This is the route indicated by most motoring maps. Bear in mind, this is 1944, of course, which depict the face of England covered by a network of thick red lines as ugly as the roads themselves. So true. If you look at those old 1940s shell maps and things, you see, in the, <laughs> you do see all that. They are a useful diagram of roads to be avoided, but that is all. My guide has always been the inch to the mile ordnance survey map, which is a mine of information about the country and the unfailing philosopher and friend of the true traveller. The route I had chosen took me straight and steeply onto the hills above Winchcombe by the way of Studley. Oh, Studley. Been to Studley. It's very nice up Studley. And from their lofty summit, the old town appeared as a small cluster of smoke-shrouded grey roofs sheltering under the great shoulders of Langley and Cleve Common. This brought me to the old hill road to Campton, which follows the majestic wave-like lift and fall of the Wolds by Lynn's Barn and Stump's Cross. It, is, it was just the turn of the year, and although the wind which swept across these great uplands had not yet lost its winter keenness, the sun shone with brave new warmth. Buds, though unbroken, had already softened the starkness of the trees and hedgerows, so that as I dropped down into Camden, they, they, gave, to, they, they gave to the view across the Vale of the Red Horse that particular misty quality which is so characteristic of early spring. There is a great charm about the broken country between Camden and Banbury. The the lias, the lias of the Warwickshire Plain thrusts a deep bay between the northernmost outposts of the Cotswolds and the Edge Hills, where the limestone appears once more. But of that more, oh God, or or. Och, <laughs> uh, oh, how do you pronounce this word? Och, 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 O C H R E O U S. Och, och, I need help. I need mental help. Och, och, I can't say it. Och, och, gracious. And I know that's wrong. And it's a word I've seen not frequently, but I can't pronounce it. Um, Hugh, anyway but of that more orcaceous hue, which is due to the presence of iron, so basically red, I'm assuming he means, the little towns and villages along the road faithfully reflect, reflect the swift transition from one geolog geological distance to another because they are old and therefore true to local tradition and environment. Thus the grey houses of Camden, with their roofs of stone slats from the hill quars, are much a part of the Cotswolds as the hills themselves, while Shipston on Stour, seven miles on, is built of that red rose brick, which is so much in harmony with the softer landscape of the Vale. The villages of the upper and lower Brails, though under the shadow of the hills, are also of brick, just journey a little farther, and the thatched cottages of Swalecliff and Tad Martin and Broughton are all built of the Tawny Edge Hill limestone. Those names are just rather... Ocker. Ocker. Thank you. Ocker. Yes, you see. It's, it's Ocker, Ocker Hugh. Thank you. After su I'm just showing my complete and utter ignorance here, and I apologise. After such a journey... At, so after such a journey, the outskirts of Banbury were a sorry sight. For the sturdy stone heart of this old market town by the Cherwell is besieged on all sides by semi-detached monstrosities whose growth has recently received fresh impetus from new industrial expansion. And we're still, still saying this. We're still saying this. Nobody listens. Doubtless it is for this reason that Banbury has received scant treatment from such authors as have visited her in search of the picturesque, for as long ago as 1911, one wrote, 
there is little of the old aspect of Banbury left now, yet the worth and the character of places cannot always be accurately judged by first impression. The beautiful show village on deeper investigation often turns out to be as lifeless and as stuffed as a stuffed bird in a museum. The cottages, weekend dormitories for jaded bismen and the great barn riding schools or road... I'm sorry. The beautiful show villages on deeper investigation often turn out to be as lifeless as the stuffed bird in a museum, the cottages, weekend dormitories... For dormitories for jaded businessmen and the great barn riding schools or road houses. For all the eye, as an old Gloucestershire farmer I know once said of them, and nothing for the belly. Oh, all for the eye and nothing for the belly. Love it. On the other hand, towns and villages which have more workaday appearance often conceal beneath an exterior that may seem positively drab, a character and charm which are no less than the old vigorous life of the place. This is what I had discovered in Banbury during my three-month stay. Had I, only, had I only stayed as many weeks, I may have missed it. The Oxford Canal is typically secretive in its passage through the town, and although there is a large wharf which handles a substantial trade in coal, a stranger would have difficulty in finding any trace of it. Even some of the inhabitants of Banbury seem to be unaware of its existence, as I discovered later, when my statement that I was living on a boat was accepted by the local tradesman as a sally of Munch Munchhausen humour. I don't blame them, for I paid several visits to the boatyard where Cressy was moored before I became certain of finding my way there with, without error. It lay down an extremely narrow street, opening unobtrusively out of a corner of the market square. The name Factory Street was almost illegible with age, and the best cue to its identity was a sign over a small shop in the corner which proclaimed tripe, ox heels and neat's foot oil for sale. The street ended at a wooden drawbridge over the canal, to the left of which was the boatyard where Cressy lay between two derelict narrowboats. When I had shipped my belongings aboard, I hurried back into the town to obtain the additional stores that I needed before the shops closed, a loaf of bread and a pint of milk, sausages for supper and bacon for breakfast, paraffin for the lamps and a sack of coke for the gasworks for the saloon stove, since the nights were still cold. On the opposite side of the drawbridge, from the boatyard, there was a lock, and on the lock side stood a toll office. There, all the boats southward, bound for Oxford with their cargoes of coal, were checked and gauged. At eight o'clock every evening, the toll clerk locked the bridge in the closed position and swung a heavy door across the towing path, so that any latecomers had to tie up until the following morning. There can be no mistaking this hour of closing, for they still ring the curfew in Banbury. I heard the measured tolling of the bell very distantly that evening as I was cooking my first meal in the galley, for the wind had fallen and the going, with the going down of the sun, and the air was still and very clear. It struck me as singularly appropriate that on this lane of still water, which was like a road that had fallen asleep, it should still it should be this tank it should be this tranquil ancient voice of the town and not the roar of traffic that i should hear i selected the most promising of the elderly and rather dubious assortments of lilo mattresses that was making my bed when the creak of tackle and the slow clip clop of hooves on the towing path opposite herald the arrival of a belated horse-boat. I looked out. The boatman was walking beside his boat, and when they drew abreast of my window they halted, dim shapes in the darkness. The tow-line fell slack as the boat, low, laden in the water, slid into view, and the scarcity, and the 
scarcely perceptible ripples around her bluff bows died as she was checked and drawn into side. Golden lamplight, golden lamplight streamed from the open aft doors of the cabin and illuminated the weather-beaten face of a woman at the tiller, glinting on her, on her gold earrings. These were my unknown neighbours on my first night afloat. Though they must have cast away soon after sunrise, they didn't disturb me, for I slept soundly, despite the fact that the mattress that I had so laboriously blown up defleated, deflated overnight, so that I woke to find myself on the hard boards. End of chapter two. I shall leave it there for today. Sorry about the second part of the reading. Um, I will make sure I read in advance so that I can get the, the um, notion of the words. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? Thank you for ochre. Yes, ochre is an Australian slang for an Aussie bloke. Oh, an ochre. Uh, looks like Rudd's... Rudd's uh, ochre or ochre? Is it ochre? Ochre? Uh, a pigment of the earth. Thank you. Looks like rust stain. Uh, Michael Angel, fascinating. Warwickshire is a very haunted county indeed i've had a number of strange experiences to recount oh how lovely we must uh, we must do ghost stories on the vogue show at some point mustn't we um ochre or ochre is a natural clay earth pigment which is a mixture of ferric oxide and varying amounts of clay and sand it ranges in color from yellow to deep orange and brown oh that sounds interesting um thank you for uh, Thank you for that. Uh, Audrey says, Ocreus. Ocreus. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, oh, yeah. M M Mouch, Munch, Munchhausen. M Mouch, Munch, Munchhausen. Is it Munch? Munchhausen. Uh, is a uh, syndrome is a, a factitious factitious disorder, a mental disorder in which a person repeatedly and deliberately acts as if he or she has a psychic or mental illness when he or she is not really it, not really sick. Oh yes, Mouch Mouch. He was a he was a, obviously a professor or something, was he? Mount Munchausen. Uh, oh, that is interesting. Uh, oh yes, neat's foot oil. That was so many interesting things come out of that. That uh, yeah, thank you for looking all this stuff up. This is really interesting. Um, hang on, I'm just going to move this. I'm going to move this over here where I can read it a bit better. Neat's foot oil rendered from shin bones and feet of cattle used to soften leather. Oh, thank you, Linda. Uh, Neat's foot. Hmm. Uh, one can buy a bag of cow's ears <laughs> to eat as a snack. <laughs> In Madrid. Oh, my God. I'll just have a, a pound of cow's ears, please. They're like pig's ears that you'd give to dogs. Um, how interesting. Another winner by the looks of things. Yes, to the ghost stories idea. Judith enjoyed that. Thank you. Really enjoyed your reading, Richard. I normally save your reading up to listen when I go for a walk. Uh, I don't, but my ex-girlfriend did, says Morton. A real passion killer. Uh, another, yeah. Do you mean that you have to eat them? Fantastic. Thank you so much for all those messages. Oh, I've made that go full screen. Now I can't make it go back again. How do I? How do I? What do I do to? Oh, there it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that sounds great. We're in the in the lockdown. We're going to be locked up in a narrow boat now for the next few weeks whilst we carry on reading uh, a beautiful Beautifully read, wonderful uh, book by uh, L. T. C. Rolt. Uh, what was his L? What does the L stand for? Is that Leonard? Um, I think about or Lionel. Can't be Lionel. Anyway, yes, ochre paint is sometimes made from mummified bodies in ancient times. My goodness. Good morning to English uh, Englishmen abroad. We've just come to the end. Um, Oh, yes, I must go and work out why this t says that it's seven hours hence than it actually is. Turbo, pork, s love pork scratchings with a pint of stout and Guinness. Dreadful, delightful. I thought you said dreadful reading. <laughs> delightful reading. Thank you very much. I will get better uh, once I get into it. It's, a, it's quite small print, but um, there we go. I could. The, the thing is, 
read that better than I can read the comments, most, mostly because it's that thing about, I don't know if other people suffer from that, if you've been reading something very close and then you try to read something that's a bit far away, plus the, <clears throat> plus the fact it's on a screen, that really doesn't help. Uh, look forward to tomorrow's reading. See you tonight, Richard and Julia and everybody. Bye for now. Bye-bye, Fiona. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. I will catch up with you uh, anon. How brilliant is that? Loving it. Absolutely loving it. I love his words, the use of words. I just wish I could have the same command of the English language. Take care and bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>